Hello, uh, my name is Juan Caballero. I'm an assistant research professor at the INDEA Software Institute in Madrid, Spain. Uh, I just finished my presentation at MAC uh, in Vienna and I told uh, the audience about uh, the malware ecosystem and specialization and outsourcing in malware and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it uh, now. So hopefully um, most of you will be familiar with cybercrime, right? And cybercrime um, has one main motivation, and that is simply put money, right? So people are able to do money with cybercrime, um, so they are very interested in it. And it's one of the, uh, the main motivations for attacks nowadays on the internet. Um, so what is the role of malware in cybercrime? Right? So one thing that people don't uh, realize often is that their computers, any internet connected computer, is actually worth money. Right? So people can actually make money of your computer. And therefore, when people tell you to secure your computer, um, they have a reason to do so. Um, so people sometimes wonder, like, why do people want access to my computer? Um, there are different reasons for this. Uh, for example, around 90% of the spam that is being sent on the internet is actually being sent from malware compromised computers. Your computer can be used also to launch what we call denial of service attacks. So you start, your computer starts generating a lot of traffic, send it to some web server out there, and it, a lot of computers do this across the internet, that server actually saturates and possibly falls down. What else? You have a lot of private information in your computer. You have things like uh, credit card numbers, potentially, username and password for your different accounts. Those are worth money. Um, your computer can be used uh, for mining bitcoins. Some people do that nowadays and someone might be interested in stealing those bitcoins from you. And if you are not doing this bitcoin mining, maybe they want to install some mining software in your computer and use it for that purpose. Um, your computer is worth uh, as a proxy. They can install some proxy and the proxy allows someone connecting to your computer and from your computer to another computer on the internet and that hides where the second connection comes from. So that's where your computer is actually a proxy. Uh, they can try to sell you what is called fake software. So you might have heard of things like fake antivirus. Suddenly you get these uh, pop-ups in your computer that say, oh, you are infected, you're infected, you should be cleaning your computer and I'm gonna sell you uh, this license to my great program that cleans your computer. That's what we call a fake antivirus. So if you go actually and pay, then you get the, they get the money of your payment, they get your credit card number in addition, and of course, that doesn't guarantee you are clean. Okay, so, so there's clear an incentive for cybercrime. And now the question is like, if you are a malware owner, how do you go ahead and actually do that monetization of computers? So you need a bunch of things to actually do this. You need the malware, first of all. Um, you need infected computers. Uh, you need servers out there on the internet, and those servers need to be hosted somewhere, physically located somewhere. Uh, you might need DNS uh, domain names to actually, so people can reach those servers. Um, you might need uh, money transfer uh, services, so you can actually, the money that you are making from these infected computers, it needs to end up in the malware owner's bank account, or maybe under his mattress, or whatever he prefers. Um, so this is complex. I mean, running like cybercrime operations is a complex matter. And as a malware owner, they want to simplify these uh, tasks. And the question is how to do it? Well, with money. That's typically the, the answer when you actually want to simplify things. So uh, if the malware owner has money, then he can do an investment and buy whatever it needs to actually launch that operation. And at the end, get a return on his investment Okay, but making more money that he actually invested. Uh, so how, how does this work? Well, attackers have realized that they can offer these services to each other. Okay, so some of those attackers will be really good at creating malware. Some will be really good at finding servers out there in the internet and the hosting that comes with them. Some of them will be good at actually offering like payment services so they can help each other in exchange for money. Um, so there's been a, what we call a lot of specialization and outsourcing in this malware ecosystem. And a lot of services have pop up to actually help attackers to make this money. So you will have people offering 
malware kits, you have people, uh, you have like commercial of the self uh, VPN services, so you can obfuscate as an attacker where you come from. Um, and there are some services that actually provide access to, ma to those infected computers. Remember, that's where the monetization comes from. So the attackers want to make money of computers. So they need to actually install their malware in those computers. So how does this work? Well, there are services that are actually allow to do this outsourcing. Uh, and there's three of these services, uh, or three prevalent ones. One is called Paper Install, and the other one Exploitation as a Service, and Exploit Kits. So Paper Install is like the most straightforward. This is like full outsourcing. I really don't want to take care of any of this. I have money as a malware owner, and I have malware, and I just want to pay someone to actually do the installation of the malware for me. So they actually look for these paper install services, which take from the clients the malware and the money, and then they take care of actually compromising the computers with that malware. And how they do that? Well, they have some demand from the clients. So they need to satisfy that demand. How do they do this? Um, in different ways. They might take care of it themselves, but that's typically hard, okay? There might be a lot of demand. So they need to rely on other people. Those are called affiliates. So in a sense, the PPI service outsources also the distribution of the malware to other parties. And then what it happens, it actually buys installations of malware from the affiliates and resells those to the clients. So in a sense, it becomes a middleman in the process, okay? Um, so how this uh, works is like the affiliates get this program from the PPI service with a unique affiliate identifier. They will actually, their goal is to install that program in the infected computers. Once the program is installed, it connects back to the PPI service. It sends the affiliate identifier. And now the PPI service knows like, oh, I need to pay this one installation to the client. Okay, sorry, to the affiliate. And then, uh, the PPI service will actually download all the client programs into your computer and suddenly you are running a lot of different malware on your computer. Okay? So this actually has a lot of benefits for the attackers because uh, there's, they don't need to worry about the compromise, they just need to worry about uh, the monetization. Okay? So there is independent innovation in the marketplace. Um, so for example, some affiliates may be really good at sending malware over spam, some other may be really good at putting malware on BitTorrent so people actually download them or on a web service. And none of them might actually be good at all of them, but by using a PPI service, the malware, the owners get access to all those distribution vectors and they don't actually need to do an investment in the different type of distribution vectors. What is the prices, for example, for these things? What happens is that your computer is worth money, but it's not worth a lot of money. So for example, um, 1,000 compromised computers on the internet is only worth like around $150 the most if those computers are located in the United States, which typically pays the most. And from there it goes down, typically with Europe, some countries in Europe maybe worth like $100, $90. I mean, these numbers are mostly from 2011 when they uh, used to publicly advertise these prices. Nowadays, these services are a little bit more uh, hidden from the public. Um, so, okay, so the computers are not worth a lot, but there's, of course, an economy of numbers. If you compromise a lot of computers, then you eventually make a... That, that's what you pay to get the computers. That doesn't mean you are not gonna get, make much more money, okay? So distribution is only part of your investment. Uh, you also need to invest on infrastructure for your servers, <coughs> You need to invest in like those uh, money transfer services, etc. So what we find out is that even the, if there is multiple distribution vectors, one of them is most prevalent, and these are web, web exploits. This is what we call in the jargon drive-by downloads, because you drive by a web server and suddenly you get insto uh, installed some malware in your computer. So how this happens is they they First of all, they attract people to their websites, okay? And once they are there, the web server interacts with your browser and tries to select a vulnerability. So that is some defect in the software that your browser or the plugins that you use, for example, for visualizing 
PDF files or for visualizing Flash, um, also with Java. So there will be some vulnerability in the software. They can exploit that, and using that exploit, they will install the malware in your computer. Okay? So one way of looking at these drive-by downloads from the point of view of economics is it's very simple. They, that drive-by download, what it does, it converts traffic into installations of malware. As what the uh, malware owner is interested in is like, what is the conversion rate of my investment, my servers? Okay? So the more traffic I send, depending on that conversion rate, the more installs I get. A typical conversion rate typically oscillates between 6 and 12%. That means between 6 and 12% of the visitors of the web server will actually live with some malware installed in their computers. So that's pretty good uh, from their point of view. Now, what we did in our research is we actually studied this uh, malware ecosystem. So we did actually three things. First of all, we studied these paper installed services. We infiltrated four of these services, and we published this work in Usenic Security in 2011. And this was joint work, uh, in addition for, uh, from in, uh, to India Software Institute, it was joint work with uh, the University of California, Berkeley, as well as the International Computer Science Institute, also in Berkeley. Then, in the second thing we investigated is this exploitation as a service. So these are services that what they do is like, they will rent you these servers. So you, actually the malware owner will pay for like $50 for one week of exploit server and they don't need to care about anything else. They just provide the traffic and get the installs. Okay? So this was joint work with a lot of uh, groups. I cannot mention all of them. This was led by Chris Greer from uh, UC Berkeley and it involved people from Google, from Josh Mason University, Unif University of California, San Diego and many others. And finally, the last work is like we study the drive-by download operations and the abuse reporting. Uh, and this is work that will be presented this coming July at DIMBA 2013. This is joint work with my students, I, Antonio Napa and Zuber Rafik. So what are those drive-by downloads operations? Um, that's when actually the same owner may run multiple servers, okay? Because one server is not enough to satisfy maybe uh, the demand. And also because those services out there in the internet and they are exposed to Defender that will actually try to take them down. So they will need to constantly keep replacing these servers with other ones to actually keep up their operation. Okay? So in order to uh, study these ones, we actually built an infrastructure to first of all collect malware from the different malware distribution vectors. So I told you about drive-by downloads, that's one of them. Uh, we also got like malware feeds from external partners uh, that provided email that they collected uh, sorry malware that they collected themselves like through spam traps, uh, also through drive-by downloads, uh, maybe through like honeypots, um, and then we collect all this malware and then we analyze it. And the way we analyze it is we run them uh, to actually understand what they do. And we collect a lot of like behavioral information. So once the malware executes in a machine, what does it do? What, what is it that it's trying to steal? What is the kind of network traffic that it actually generates to connect to its common and cultural infrastructure? Um, we take screenshots of what's happening inside the computer. And using that information, we actually classify the malware into families. And it's important to classify the malware into families because there exists this thing called polymorphism. That is the same malware. Okay, the same fake antivirus, for example, has many different versions. All of them do the same, but they look actually different. So from the antivirus point of view, all of those are different programs, even if they actually do the same. And if you don't know about this, then it's very difficult to actually extract conclusions about what is happening, okay? Because you see many different malware, and even if they do the same, you don't know that. So classification helps you with that. And <clears throat> After we do that, we also look at the monetization of those families. So we want to understand, well, I know all these like malware files uh, belong to the same family, but how do they actually make the money? Are they making the money through click fraud? Okay, so click fraud is when, uh, for example, there is an advertisement on the web and the advertiser is paying for visitors. Once we actually have this uh, information, we actually collect some results. And we actually uh, have some interesting conclusions. Some of them are like, for example, the malware distribution is geographical. That is, your computer, I mean, I already hinted at this when I told you they pay different 
for installations in different countries. And that's because some malware are actually interested only in computers in some specific countries. For example, we saw a family uh, called Glacehool that monetizes click fraud, and they are interested in computers installed in the US. Why? Because maybe the advertiser is only interested in people that are coming from the US. So if the advertiser only is interested in that, they need to satisfy that demand. They need to fake those clicks from computers that actually come from the US. We see things like spam bots. Um, they send a spam from your computer, and those, they don't really care where the computers that they infect are. Uh, why? Because as long as they can connect to an email server and they can send email, it's, it's the same if the computer is in the US or it's actually in Russia or in Japan. Um, some other families, like for example Adware, those also are interested all, only in some geographical locations. Um, why? Because for example they will show you some screenshots, they need to be in a specific language. And if, of course, if the language is English and they actually infect some computers in Italy, well, maybe the Italians don't care about that screenshots in English. Um, okay, so that's about geographical distribution. We found more things. What we found is we compare different malware distribution vectors. I told you about these drive-by downloads. We look at the spam. We look at BitTorrent. And we actually collected malware from all of them. But what, where most of the malware comes from is from these drive-by downloads. So the web is really the main malware distribution vector nowadays, according to our measurements. So what we find there, what are the big monetizers with things like uh, malware families um, that do fake antivirus or fake software in general, click fraud, information stealing, those are typically big monetizers. Uh, what else we find? We find that typically when you get infected by some malware, is not only one malware that gets into your computer. Why all? Because all this economy uh, that I told you about, there is this PPI services, paper install. So once they actually install or the paper install downloader in your computer, that's the first step, they will download all the client programs into your machine. So suddenly you don't run one single malware, you run a lot of malware. And those malware may actually download other malware by themselves. So this becomes like a tree. A and after 10 minutes, you might be running like maybe 10 different malware families on your computer. Okay? That becomes really complex, uh, both for understanding what is happening uh, and also because of all the uh, problems they introduce in the marketplace. Okay? So there will be fight over those computers and who can actually make the money and competition for them. So, well, with this, I want to conclude. I hope you learn a little bit about like malware and the role that it has in cybercrime and how actually people want to monetize your computer. And thanks for your attention.